Thank you, Jonathan. Ladies and gentlemen, I would start immediately with one concession to the other side, which Michael referred to earlier. If 60 years ago the post-war Labour government had not taken a decision to develop an atomic bomb with, in the words of Ernest Bevin, a bloody Union Jack on top, we would not be having this debate. Were we not already in the nuclear business, it is highly unlikely that we would wish to go there now. You might regard that as a telling point against our side of the debate. I regard it as first a mark of the perspicacity of the Attlee government and second a stroke of great good fortune. And as a Labour supporter myself, I am as proud of Labour's role in creating Britain's bomb as I am of Labour's role in creating the National Health Service. When Attlee and Bevin took that decision, the arguments for an A-bomb, an independent nuclear deterrent, were right and they were far more plausible, I think, than at any time during the Cold War. There was no NATO. The United States was militarily exhausted. Congress had passed a resolution forbidding the sharing of nuclear information with any other power, even us. In those circumstances, with an aggressive and expansionist Soviet Union, the case for an independent nuclear deterrent made eminent sense. With the creation of NATO and the establishment of collective security, the arguments shifted. They were less prominent, they were less persuasive, some of them were very bad indeed. Winston Churchill's argument to his cabinet colleagues was that an independent deterrent provided us with our badge to the royal enclosure at Ascot. A slightly better argument was Nye Bevins that nuclear renunciation would leave us naked in the conference chamber. But one argument, and Sir Michael was particularly prominent in espousing it as a civil servant, was a very good one. It was that NATO required, or NATO benefited, from a second center of nuclear decision making. In order to prevent any possibility, or mitigate the possibility, of a miscalculation by an aggressor who might misunderstand the US commitment to the forward defense of Europe. The Soviet Union, however brutal and expansionist, however, was always a risk-averse society. Even the most bellicose, even the most excitable of Soviet leaders, Khrushchev, was apparently scared witless by the, uh, by the demand or by the speculation of his ally Fidel Castro that there might be scope for a Soviet first strike on American cities if the US invaded Cuba during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Therefore, the argument for an independent deterrent was always a marginal one. In my view, the argument in our second nuclear age with proliferation of nuclear technologies and the likelihood of the absolute weapon, in the famous words of Bernard Brody, the military strategist, the absolute weapon being acquired by the worst of states makes the argument for Trident that much more compelling, that much better. There is a common argument that our threats at the moment are not those of aggressive states, they are those of terrorists, of suitcase bombs, of climate change. All that is true and it is quite irrelevant to this debate. We don't need either an army, a navy and an air force to respond to climate change. Nonetheless, we don't abolish the armed forces merely because they can't cope and can't counter all threats. The task of defense planning is to counter existing threats. It is also to anticipate remote contingencies. And remote contingencies happen. The Yom Kippur War was totally unexpected by an apparently militarily prepared Israel. The Falklands War was totally unexpected. Saddam Hussein's annexation and plunder of Kuwait was unexpected. We are now in the stage where, over the next few years, certainly within our lifetimes, some pretty bloody awful states are liable to lay their hands on these technologies. We know very little about the nuclear, about the, uh, nuclear ambitions of the totalitarian nightmare state North Korea other than by what is implied by its secession from the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. We know far more about Iran, an extremist leadership but a relatively more open society. And we know that very few analysts, in fact I know of no reputable analyst at any independent academy or reputable NGO who believes that Iran's 
nuclear program is intended purely for the generation of electricity. The threat of nuclear blackmail by an emerging nuclear power is not a fanciful one. We might have, perfectly plausibly, a scenario like the Falklands. Nuclear unilateralists at the time argued that the fact that Argentina took sovereign territory, British sovereign territory, meant that Polaris, our nuclear deterrent, was not effective. Well, that was true up to a point. But imagine if Argentina had been a nuclear armed power and we had not been. The idea that we might have sent a task force to confront them is quite fanciful. In those circumstances, an appalling military dictatorship would have gained territories by acts of force in defiance of international law and there would have been nothing that we could do about it. Remote contingencies do happen. Our acquisition, our replacement of a nuclear deterrent through to the middle of the next century is our insurance premium of making sure that a threat of nuclear blackmail will not work and cannot be effective because there will not be a crisis that can escalate out of our control. There are, I think, and I'm not an absolutist either, like Michael, I'm not an absolutist, I think there are two respectable arguments against replacing Trident. One is cost and one is redundancy. Michael has already referred to the question of cost. We actually have a very good record of procuring Trident on budget and on time. The, uh, the, the costs of acquiring Trident came in really well ahead of budget. The, uh, the estimated cost was well over 15 billion at 95, 96 prices. It came, it came in at, um, uh, at, uh, at something over 12 billion. We have experience of cost-effective nuclear deterrent. And the fact that we have commonality with the United States makes it a particularly valuable transatlantic relationship to, uh, to seek or to, to, to extend our nuclear deterrent. The other respectable argument against Trident, as I say, is redundancy, that we have the protection of the US nuclear umbrella. This is quite patently not an argument that can be put by at least two members of the proposal team in this debate. Uh, Rebecca, whom I know and respect, spent five years dancing on the silos at Greenham Common. Uh, there were plenty of people on the pro-nuclear side of the argument in the Cold War who got things wrong, who overestimated the vulnerability of NATO's nuclear deterrent, who underestimated the fragility of Soviet communism. But no one got things more wrong than the Greenham Common Peace Campaign. There were women lying in the path of the airlifter that took the weapons out of Greenham Common, never mind took them back in, took them in in the first place, because protest had become their entire life. They didn't understand deterrence and they didn't understand disarmament either. When Ronald Reagan turned out to be not a simple-minded warmonger but a rather simple-minded nuclear abolitionist, they were completely nonplussed. In the case of the Scottish National Party, they proposed that Scotland withdraw from NATO altogether. Ladies and gentlemen, if you were entertainments officer and bar manager of the premillennial dispensationalist exclusive brethren, you would have fewer problems of intellectual consistency and ideological coherence than the defense spokesman, ladies and gentlemen, of the Scottish National Party. <laughs> Trident is our insurance premium. Let's keep it.